We've all probably heard the tired myth of how the British and the American Revolution were stupid because they didn't understand guerrilla warfare and how they stood out in the middle of open fields and allowed themselves to be picked off one by one while the Americans took pot shots at them from behind trees. Complete nonsense, obviously, as shown by the very existence of the British Light Infantry Companies, who were trained to use the very same guerrilla tactics usually prescribed to the American militia, and who sometimes even beat the militia at their own game. Disregarding this, however, some armchair historians will postulate that due to their bright red uniforms, the Redcoats could not have possibly utilized guerrilla tactics effectively because the red color would simply stand out too much in the dense woods. My friend and colleague Brandon F. has already made a video demonstrating that wearing red does not necessarily impede one's ability to remain concealed, especially in a wooded environment. However, it is true that red is still probably not the first color most would pick to wear in such circumstances. The natural first choice would be green. So aside from the fact that red was cheaper, why didn't the British wear green? That's actually a trick question, because some units in the British service actually did wear green, specifically Loyalist units, including a few notable ones, such as the King's American Regiment, the Queen's Rangers, Butler's Rangers, and Tarleton's Legion. Of those four, the Queen's Rangers were arguably the most well known for their use of green. The unit was originally founded by Robert Rogers in 1776, but John Graves Simcoe, formerly a grenadier captain of the 40th Foot, took command in 1777, and at this time the rangers were outfitted with green uniforms. Under Simcoe's leadership, the rangers became a mixed unit of grenadier, light infantry, and battalion company men, and also included a mounted contingent of hussars and light dragoons. However, all of them were trained extensively in the use of light infantry tactics. Simcoe saw great value in the use of light troops, stating at one point, the command of a light corps, or as it is termed, the service of a partisan, is generally esteemed to be the best mode of instruction for those who aim at higher station. Under his command, the Rangers became a highly effective fighting force and would distinguish themselves at several engagements throughout the North American campaign. When it was proposed in 1778 that the Rangers, along with several other Loyalist regiments, should abandon their green uniforms in exchange for the standard red, Simcoe, seeing the value of green for his preferred style of warfare, protested claiming, Green is without comparison the best color for light troops with dark accoutrements, and if put on in the spring, by autumn it nearly fades with the leaves, preserving its characteristics of being scarcely discernible at a distance. Simcoe's protest was noted, and the rangers were allowed to keep their green coats. The British Legion, commanded by Bannister Tarleton, likewise was noted for using the color green to their advantage. Like the Queen's Rangers, the Legion was a mixed unit of horse and foot, consisting of six cavalry troops and four light infantry companies by 1780. That same year, a London newspaper described the unit thusly, Their uniforms are a light green waistcoat, without skirts, with black cuffs and capes, and nothing more. Their arms consist of a saber and one pistol. Thus lightly accoutred, and mounted on the swiftest horses the country produces, it is impossible for the enemy to have any notice of their approach till they actually receive the shock of their charge. That is likely an exaggeration for propaganda purposes, but it is interesting to note that even civilian newspapers of the time are making note of the tactical benefits of green, so they were far from ignorant of its potential benefits. It's worth noting, however, that the color green for Loyalist units was not chosen specifically with the intent to be used for camouflage purposes, although some commanders like Simcoe did use it to great effect in this regard. In fact, the use of green was by no means universal. The coats were made by contractors, and these contractors would use whatever colors they had available when the orders for the coats were placed. So if they had green on hand, that's what the troops got. If they had brown, then they got brown, and if they had red, they got red, etc. Wearing green in an 18th century military context also comes with some significant drawbacks. While it can make it harder for the enemy to spot you, it can also have the opposite effect of making it difficult to discern friend from foe. This is exacerbated by the fact that the British are hardly the only ones in this time period to have the idea to wear green. On the American side, for example, the Continental Marines, the 4th Continental Light Dragoons, Lee's Legion, and the 1st Continental Rifle Regiment all wore green. In June 1777, shortly before the Battle of Monmouth, while the Queen's Rangers were screening the advance from Allentown, they came upon two rebel horsemen who, upon seeing the green uniforms, mistook them for members of Lee's Legion, and proceeded to divulge valuable information regarding the Continental movements. Eventually, one of the men wondered aloud what Sir Henry Clinton was up to, to which Simcoe himself replied, 
you shall ask him yourself, for we are British. According to Simcoe's own journal, this happened with surprising regularity over the course of the war. It would happen again in Virginia in 1781 outside of Richmond. Simcoe's advanced guard came across a group of Ripple militia who, once again, deceived by the green uniforms, approached Simcoe directly and held conversation with him for some time before Simcoe apprehended them. But while the green uniforms often worked to Simcoe's advantage in this regard, this would not always be the case for other Loyalist units. In February 1781, at the Battle of Hall River in North Carolina, a group of Loyalist militia under command of Dr. John Pyle happened to cross a column of horse led by Henry Lee. Both sides wore similar green uniforms. Pyle's men mistook Lee for Bannister Tarleton of the British Legion and allowed him to pass unmolested. Lee, embracing the opportunity, passed along their line at the head of the column with the intent of speaking with Pyle directly and covertly forcing his surrender with minimal bloodshed. According to Henry Lee's own memoirs, when he approached Pyle, Lee grasped him by the hand and was in the act of consummating his plan when some of Pyle's men discovered the ruse and began to fire on Lee's column. Lee's cavalry immediately turned on Pyle's troops, and 90 of them were killed. At least, that's one account of the action. Another suggests that both sides were initially ignorant of the other's identity. Captain Joseph Graham, who rode with Lee, initially took Pyle's men to belong to an American militia regiment led by one Joseph Dixon, who had previously been to his right. However, he then noticed that the uniforms of Pyle's men were cleaner and that they had strips of red cloth in their hats, indicating the mark of a loyalist. Graham turned to his fellow captain, a man named Eggleston, who was riding next to him, and remarked, That is a company of Tories. What is the reason that they have arms? Eggleston then called to a man in Pyle's ranks and inquired, To whom do you belong? When the man answered that he was a friend of His Majesty, Eggleston struck him over the head, and thus commenced the slaughter. These accounts illustrate that cases of mistaken identity through use of similar uniform colors could sometimes prove to be quite costly. In an era when uniform color is tied closely with national identity and allegiance, it is perhaps wise to keep uniform colors as consistent as possible to prevent such occurrences from becoming the norm. This represents one plausible reason for why the color green never took off as the standard, despite the obvious practical application for camouflage. Another reason is that in a traditional line battle scenario, you want your troops to be as visible as possible, not less. And although non-linear partisan style tactics do have their role to play in the revolution, and leaders like John Grave Simcoe did utilize them to great effect, not everyone can be John Grave Simcoe, and linear tactics are still the law of the land at this time. A majority of the battles of the revolution are still going to be decided by these traditional linear battle tactics of the day, and this is where the British and Continental armies alike saw most of their success. Guerrilla warfare, partisan tactics, bush fighting, whatever you want to call it, is useful in that it provides a consistent, slow bleed to enemy morale, but it does not necessarily win battles. Partisan tactics would ultimately favor the Americans not in as much due to their less brightly colored uniforms, but more due to, shall we say, their home field advantage. In order to effectively plot out an ambush, you need to have some knowledge of the local geography, which British commanders frequently did not have. Such tactics are also best employed by an army on the defensive, and especially during the Southern Campaign in the later years of the war, this is not the position that the British frequently found themselves in. They were very much on the offensive, particularly during the pursuit of Nathaniel Green in 1781, in which they were forced to destroy most of their supplies just to keep pace with the rebels. So again, even if they were all clad in green, it likely would not have done them much good in the grand scheme. Imagine you're a continental soldier in North Carolina being chased by approximately 2,000 men. It doesn't really matter at that point what color those men are wearing, they're going to stand out. But perhaps the biggest reason why they didn't wear green for camouflage, besides all of the other reasons I just listed, was because of the standard issue weapon of the time. These are going to be flintlock muskets with black powder-based ammunition. And even a single musket produces an extraordinary amount of smoke and noise that effectively gives your position away immediately as soon as you fire it. As one interpreter at Fort George is fond of saying, I can hide in this field and look like a bush for days, but how many times do you think I can fire this weapon before somebody says, um, that bush just fired at me? This isn't like the modern era when you have things like suppressors and flash hiders and most importantly, smokeless powder, which doesn't come around until the 1880s. And it's really not until the invention of smokeless powder that armies start to abandon their brightly colored uniforms. Less smoke on the battlefield, less reason to have your troops stand out. This is also a time when most soldiers at this point would be armed with bolt-action rifles with magazines able to produce accurate fire at a substantially higher rate than what can be achieved with a musket or even a breech-loading rifle like the Martini Henry, effectively putting an end to the necessity for volley fire in linear formations and increasing the practicality of camouflage tenfold. 
For these reasons, the British Army relinquished their red coats in 1897, just before the Second Boer War of 1899 to 1902, over a century after the Revolution. So it wasn't ignorance or stupidity that drove the British to cling to the red coat, it was that at the end of the day, red was, as a whole, simply more practical. And again, as has been mentioned before, it was cheaper. All right, well, there we have it, another video. And as you can see, I am back in the red coat, slightly different red coat than uh, you might be familiar with from before, but a red coat nonetheless. So. Uh, I do hope that you found this video informative and interesting as always. Leave a like and a comment down below if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. And as always, God save the king.